All right, so thanks for coming again. My name is John Snell, um, treasurer of the Digital Assembly. This is the roundtable portion of the symposium, Digital Platforms and the Future of Books. And I'll just start by introducing our panelists. Um, Elizabeth Swanstrom, Florida Atlantic University. Jay Bolter, Georgia Tech. <coughs> David Blakesley, Clemson. Bob Stein, the, future for the, uh, the Institute for the Future of the Book. Terry, Har Terry Harpool, UF English. Um, Laurie Taylor, Digital Humanities Librarian here at UF. And Greg Almer, UF English. I moved here because I could always see half the audience. Yeah. <laughs> We've also segregated ourselves into them and us, yeah, or us and them. Or something. Yeah, and this is not organized, so it's fine. Right. It just fell in that way. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, um, the topic of this symposium really is the same. The topic of this round table, or however table we want to call it, um, is really the same as the topic of the symposium, Digital Platforms and the Future of Books. And uh, I don't really want to make a whole lot of framing remarks here. In fact, I don't want to make any framing remarks. I just want to sort of let uh, the discussion evolve where it may. Um, so what I'm going to do is just offer a couple general questions to get things started, especially if you're not familiar with some of the speakers' work, get uh, familiar with their interests and their positions. Um, and then after those couple questions, just going to totally open it up speakers, uh, questions for each other, you guys, questions for the speakers. Sound good? All right, <clears throat> so first question, and uh, we can start with Greg and work towards um, my left. Uh, first question, which kinds of digital platforms do you engage with most in your work, either as a scholar, a publisher, a designer, a teacher, a librarian, we have a lot of different uh, capacities represented here. And why do you consider these platforms to be important to the future of reading, writing, publishing, archiving, et cetera? Well, so we're gonna do this, take turns? Yeah, and seeds in the conversation. I see. Right, <laughs> exactly. Okay, okay, well, uh, you know, my, um, Feeling about what's going on, like yesterday, and looking at the young people and so forth, uh, what's happening in the future is, I guess, uh, I feel like I'm sort of like Moses looking at the promised land, you know, knowing I'm never going to be there. Um, so, just, just uh, some, somewhat envious about the future of, of, uh, of thinking and, and learning and, and the media that are coming. Uh, this, this is related to the fact that, uh, I mean, I go back a ways in thinking about media, and so, so in my case, when the photocopy machine came in, I thought that we'd reached nirvana. I did, you know, because what happens with the photocopy machine, I think maybe many of us have had this experience, is uh, that when you photocopy an essay, you don't have to read it. This is the beauty, like you, this is, the, and our technology needs to keep, keep up with this, but you photocopy and you've got it, you could read it, uh, but, you know, you probably, won't. Uh, and so what we need is a photocopy machine that actually, you know, has a semantic web stuff that actually reads it for you. You know, this would be, and it kind of gives you a little crazy. Uh, so like the photo, and also just the idea I wanted to use images in my teaching. Uh, and so with the photocopy machine, I could give students assignments. Keep in mind, I come from an English department. I see some of my college from, college from art are here. You know, their students walk in and they say, and, and the art teachers say, do a project, you know, do, make something. And you sit at the English department students and they, they really get upset, uh, or, or or they write a paper for you. Uh, so if you want to use images, I mean, again, the photocopy machine allows you to do kind of cut and paste collage things. So I, like, so I, so my, I thought, wow, this we really, you know, we're really getting along here. So uh, and, and this is related to the fact that, uh, and I should preface this, uh, I'm going to admit something about my intellectual approach. Uh, I enjoyed a documentary so about Stephen Hawking and asked him why he went into theoretical <coughs> physics. He said, because it's so easy. Um, so for Stephen Hawking, I guess theoretical <laughs> physics is easy. Uh, I'm pretty lazy, and that's why I went into theory. Uh, I'm going to take that one. <laughs> uh, but so the so thing about, about theory is that uh, you you can imagine all kinds of things. You don't have to actually do them. Like conceptual arts, like this is totally genius. Uh, 
say you're going to do something, but you don't actually have to do it. Um, so what I liked about what I like really like about the internet, and this gets me around to the to the platform that I that I use most, is the blog. Uh, the blog is America. Now maybe it's the Xerox machine of tomorrow or something, but the blog is just amazing. So, and I'm just I'm at home. I, I get an idea. I see something. I put a link out. I write two paragraphs, and then later I add another fragment to that, so more than pretty soon, like on my blog theoretics, I've got. Uh, I don't know, several hundred posts and many hundreds of links and, and you know, and then I rate it every once in a while to write an essay. Uh, so, so the blog is just this multimedia platform that makes everything extremely easy for someone as lazy as me who doesn't want to learn uh, how to do everything. Uh, and this is where I think things are going. Things are not going the way of Lexia to Perplexia, my good friend Helen Emmett, they're not going that way. Things are going to get easier and easier and easier. Uh, this is what this is. This is the miracle, and this is the magic of, of post literacy. What I call electricity is we're going to have to make thinking much, much easier than it is right now in literacy. Thanks, Larry. Um, I I have not what you said about the Xerox machine um, because working with um, I'm in the library, working in the digital library center. So many, often we'll see collections that people are, have their precious photocopies, and you see you can see from these. Um, from these collections, you know, where you come in and you're doing review of a collection that's on pallets, you know, the same way they deliver like tile to your house, you have pallets of boxes and you're going through them and there are all of these different photocopies from the 70s and the 80s from different conference papers. And these are early, you know, it's just like the blog, people are making Xeroxes and they're disseminating their work through the photocopy. And they're also, they are re collecting as reading. A lot of the things may not have been read, but they've been collected and therefore people feel like they have the information through the possession. And that uh, touches on some of the things that were said earlier uh, by Elizabeth, which is really, uh, yesterday, um, which is really interesting, the idea of collecting as reading. Um, in my own work, the interfaces that I'm interested in, uh, really I'm interested in anything that can deliver um, what's needed, whether that's the Xerox machine, whether that's the fax machine, early fax networks where people are furiously faxing articles to different colleagues to help disseminate information, using blogs to help disseminate. Um, being in the uh, Digital Library Center and focusing on digital uh, preservation and archiving to make sure that you can move forward and across any of the different interfaces, I'm interested in artifactual fidelity um, and openness and standards. Um, so as long as we can make sure whatever the artifact is, we can transmit it through any of the interfaces that can support it, that's what I'm interested in. The Kindle, which we uh, talked about yesterday, is a pretty impoverished um, device um, just to give one example, if you're looking at rare books and artifacts, if you're looking at scientific uh, books or if you're looking at um, popular things, things where it doesn't matter if the text reflows, things that it doesn't matter if you have the actual image as an artifact, and that's not true for all scientific texts, but many scientific texts that are um, newer, I guess really just newer texts, um, where the text reflow is acceptable, um, then the Kindle's a great device. It's lighter weight, it's easier, and it's easy for people to do their annotations, to share them, although that is still locked within a non-standards compliant format, and so that proprietary formats are always an issue. But anything that helps the dissemination of information helps support these scholarly networks, especially as the scholarly networks engage with the public and with the artifacts. The, there's the device that I'm interested in. Thanks, Mike. In a former life, uh, I spent a good deal of my time uh, working in and, and designing in hypertext systems of one sort. Uh, this is part of my connection to Jay's work through Story Space and, and to Bob's work uh, through, uh, I, I actually did use um, his toolbox, his company's toolbox to create works. Uh, uh, he made a living at it for a while. Uh, I think of my, my, my interest in media as primarily interest in hybridity of media. I, I'm very much committed to both electronic texts and the, rep uh, the digital representations of texts and digital instantiations of texts, those things that are born digital, as well as those things that are recreated <coughs> digitally. But I'm also very interested in the material culture of print. Um, I, I wear a couple different hats. I, I, I'm working in new media studies. I'm working in uh, human-computer interface theory and um, in sort of narrative theory of, of those structures. But I'm also working in 19th century illustrated fiction. And, in my mind, these things fit together because they, they are both um, scenes in which I can rehearse problems of the relation of text to image, um, uh, the 
relation of the reader to structures of text and image and how the reader's engagement is transformed and shaped, and also uh, structures of intertextuality. So uh, how texts parlay with one another, how they connect to and, and contest one another. This is particularly rich in, in, uh, in the 19th century in very large uh, corpora of, of a number of writers who write lots and lots of novels with lots and lots of illustrations, and they're all talking to each other, talking about each other. And that cacophony is exemplary in a certain way. <coughs> in media forms, of course, it's both in the popular versions of that that we see in everything, in the entire gamut of, of popular uh, informational practice, but also in these kind of high art forms like Talent Memon's poetry and so on, in which we see this again, this generative collision of text and image. Uh, the platforms in which I'm most interested these days, and I may get a chance to speak about it a little bit when I respond to Bob's talk today, it, are wikis. And I'm particularly interested in the use of wikis in teaching for a couple of, of, of reasons that I'll just very briefly summarize here. Um, one is the learning curve is very flat. I don't have to teach students a lot of stuff about web page design. And in many ways, wikis are disarmingly easy, so they can get going right away. The conceptual labor is what's challenging. Thinking about polyauthorial and polylinear uh, composition is what is particularly useful. And I've been experimenting in my classes. Again, I may speak a bit, a bit about this this afternoon. In using, basically, I'm using wikis now in all of my classes. In the classes that are devoted to media theory, but also in classes that have no ostensible upfront connection to media theory. And in pushing students to think about their print literature reading as embedded within a hybrid medial environment. Because I guess to go back full circle to the initial comment, I, my interest in hybridity is in part because I'm a media historian who thinks about old media and new media and their interrelations, but also my interest in hybridity is because hybridity is the current condition of media. We live in a transitional incanabial phase in which we're moving between and back and forth, and the futures of the book, or I say futures, the futures of the book are tangled up in these different instances of print and electronic representation. Thanks, Tim. I disagree. <laughs> um, well, I thought I would uh, mention uh, one platform that I work with uh, uh, quite a bit in all different kinds of contexts, and, um, and that is uh, Drupal, which is an open source content management system. Um, one of my uh, friends, Charlie Lowe, who uh, edits the Writing Spaces series for Part of Press, always describes it uh, as uh, like a box of Legos. Uh, so it was interesting to see uh, some of the definitions in the, in the history there. And you know where Lego got its name, you know, the building of walls with bricks. Um, but uh, what I like about Drupal is that uh, uh, you can adapt it to all kinds of uh, scenarios, uh, wikis, blogs, that sort of thing, and, and so it's a useful teaching tool. But um, uh, in a deeper way, uh, uh, as a content management system, um, it enacts this distinction between form and content in its structure um, so that you have uh, any particular page that you might look at on a Drupal site uh, is constructed um, using content from a database. Uh, so there are all these little pieces being put together according to a style sheet uh, that you've developed. Um, and the style sheet, of course, is the structure and the, and the, and the style and then the content is coming from the data. Um, and uh, keeping those distinct, uh, I think, is important. And that's one of the um, distinguishing features, I think, of the, uh, the digital age, the, the ability to remake things in all different kinds of forms. Uh, um, and so what I'm doing with Drupal, uh, uh, at least uh, with respect to publishing, is um, we're developing a uh, complete publishing operation uh, that is a Drupal installation uh, that will uh, help us manage uh, complex tasks like uh, tracking royalties and sales. Uh, that's something that I wasn't expecting to have to become an expert about. I don't know what I was thinking, starting a publishing company and not realizing I'd have to do that. But, um, uh, and tracking metadata. Uh, metadata for books, uh, you know, this data has to be sent around to so many different organizations and groups and libraries and book distributors and, you know, 
know, sellers and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a, a gargantuan task. Everybody wants different kinds of metadata, for example. Um, and then we have to uh, uh, promote and market. Uh, so we're going to be doing that through Drupal um, uh, and actually selling books. Uh, so there's got to be an e-commerce uh, uh, component to it, and Drupal has all these pieces in place. Um, so it's going to be a complete publishing management system uh, adapted uh, to the, the situation where you would be publishing journals or books, that sort of thing, in, in any kind of form. And we're going to create a, an installation uh, and then make it uh, contribute it back to the Drupal community so other people can just take that installation and, and hit the ground running with everything in place and then they can customize it to their needs. Um, and that is important to me because um, uh, most universities I've been, uh, I've worked at and, and heard about um, tend to get locked into proprietary systems uh, to manage their, their activities and their data and so on. And um, these things are, tend to be very inflexible, they're very expensive. Um, and when we use systems like that, I mean, there are publishing systems out there that I can buy for $20,000. Uh, but when we use them, we're not really developing anything. We're not contributing back uh, to the uh, academic, scholarly community. And, and open source, I think, is one way that, that we can you know, uh, enact that ethical obligation to, to improve things for other people uh, in our fields and in the scholarly community. So, that's a kind of underlying goal behind this. So. I work in two areas, and the platforms that I use are very much determined by those different areas of activity. On the one hand, I work in um, media studies, both historical media studies and digital media studies. I'm trying to understand the relationship between earlier uh, media, media forms, and uh, the contemporary, uh, complex contemporary media scene, which as Terry says is characterized by everybody, <coughs> but in which digital media play a, uh, an enormous role. And in that capacity, I use all the platforms that I think everyone else on the, this panel use, printed books, scanned materials that really come from print that are delivered electronically, um, various forms of electronic um, catalog systems and uh, information retrieval and all of that, and word processors and everything from producing the work. In my other area of activity, though, which is um, to work closely with computer scientists at Georgia Tech on the development of a particular new media platform digital media platform uh, called Augmented Reality, or what's now becoming known as Mobile Augmented Reality Browsers for smartphones like the iPhone. In that capacity, um, my, my work is with a platform that I don't think really falls comfortably under the rubric of a reading and writing system, except in the very general sense that uh, you know, semiotics can understand the activities that go on in augmented reality as a kind of, of reading and writing on the world. But the concerns and interests of my colleagues and myself in creating these, what we're working on in particular are cultural heritage applications using augmented reality. So uh, we are working at, uh, have worked uh, with a uh, cemetery in Atlanta that is uh, historically important try to find ways in which we could bring the history of uh, people buried in the cemetery alive to, to visitors on their phones. Um, the concerns that, they, that my colleagues have, the programming that goes into it, the, the work that goes into it, is a very different community, really, from the community that I think is largely represented here. And therefore, uh, if we come to the question of the future of books, the uh, attitude toward that future is very different two different communities that I uh, occupy, or at least uh, have, have important relationships to. And I think that, in fact, the 
my program, I should say, parenthetically, the program I work in is called Digital Media. And many of my colleagues, not just the ones I work with, but in reality, many of them come out of uh, technological backgrounds. Uh, so that their commitment toward uh, any information system like the book is much more utilitarian than operational, not historically grounded, and, uh, and not humanistically informed in the ways that uh, this community is. All I'm trying to say is that, uh, in, in some sense, at a unitary conference like this, I feel as if I'm both an insider and an outsider at the same time, trying to understand what's happening to the future of this very important, um, historically important information technology called the book uh, in a way that is both sympathetic to the historical tradition and perhaps uh, skeptical or at least critical of what the future might be. Um, I think it's a, it, it varies for me which kind of platforms uh, that I use depending on you know, the role I have as a writer, the role I have as a reader, a researcher, educator, um, and, and a citizen. And so I'll start with, um, I'll start with as a writer, as my role as a writer. And you'll notice I'm up here next to these beautiful machines with my pen and, and my paper. And it's a, it's, a, it's a sad, tragic insight that I had a few years ago that I simply type faster than I'm capable of thinking. And so when I'm sitting there typing, the most terrible crap will come out of my head <laughs> and onto the page. And I realize I really need to slow down and think. And then once I have my thoughts in order, I can go and then sort of you know polish and, and write the machine. And so there's a new tool coming out by Wacom, which I'm extremely excited about. And I'm sure you're familiar with Wacom, the tap, right? A lot of illustrators use it. My husband does a web comic, a little plug, it's called Odoo and Friends. <laughs> and he uses the Wacom to do his illustrations. Well, Wacom's coming out with a pen. It's been released already, I think, in Australia. Um, you can't get it yet. There are other versions of it, but they've been sort of um, not as well reviewed. And basically, you have a pen like this, you have a stylus, you write on any surface, you clip a little, uh, some type of receiver there, and everything you write will be digitized, right? I'm very excited about that technology, um, but you know, I don't, I don't, I haven't used it yet. But there, as I said, there are versions of it that are already available. Um, I also use Google Books um, all the time, and in part that's because of the ease of access. But it's also because, I'll be honest, I fudge the citation with MLA guidelines because I don't think MLA has caught up with um, citing e-readers um, or digital platforms. And so if I find a book on Google Books, there's a page number right there. I will simply pretend, here I am, <laughs> outing myself. I'll simply pretend that I'm reading that book in print and cite it accordingly because it's much easier um, that way. Um, and then finally, as a researcher, I am really excited about open access publishing. And I have all of the anxieties that we all um, share about tenure and promotion. And yet, I, I, my heart beats for open access. You know, I feel like information should be uh, readily accessible and, of course, um, transparent. And uh, so I have a lot of uh, hope for uh, independent publishing companies like Parler. Uh, but also, a uh, book came out a couple years ago. I, I reviewed it, which is why I know about it, uh, called Digitize This Book by David Hall. It's really exciting stuff that's going on in terms of open access, rigorous, scholarly publication. And that was my one concern when I reviewed the books, like, wow, this is the most amazing, exciting, you know, thing I've read about, but where is it? You know, show me. <laughs> and they're doing it, right? Since the, the publication of the book, they, they've actually started to produce words. So um, that's my role as a researcher. As a reader, one thing I, I forgot to, you know, I blinked out yesterday when Jay asked the wonderful question about, you know, talent amendments really difficult, demanding text as being representative of the reading experience today. It is not accurate. But I think platforms such as alter, augmented reality, um, as well as locative narratives, uh, platforms that are taking reading out into the real world. Um, stories, for example, um, that you will access at different points in a city and be able to respond accordingly uh, to the narrative structure that, you know, that's being offered to you and to help shape it, I think are really exciting for me as a reader. Um, and then finally, as a citizen, I'm not going to talk about the, the stuff as an educator, but as a citizen, um, the things that I'm most interested in now in terms of um, <clears throat> reading platforms 
are ways that we can use uh, new technology to rethink environmental practice. Uh, and that's the project that I'm, I'm currently uh, you know, mixed up with right now, writing a book on it. And so I'm very excited about tools that allow us to think about our connections to uh, the real world and um, consumption, uh, habits of consumption. And there are lots of excellent projects out there that um, are simply are, are, are not um, are not getting the attention I think they deserve um, for, for us to, to be thinking about um, being good, good citizens. And so, uh, stop. <coughs> um, I'm going to make sort of a meta comment about this. Uh, I think there's a tendency to confuse platform with technology. A book to me is a technology, it's not a platform. Drupal to me would be a technology, not a platform. Um, most of the things discussed to me are technologies, not platforms. And what I mean by that distinction is that a platform, I think, is, a, is an ecosystem of interrelated technologies that work together to make something that we all use. An example, I think, this is not a platform I think would like, but I think it's an example of a platform, is the Kindle is not a platform. Kindle is a technology. But when you put the Kindle together with the browsing capabilities of Amazon and WhisperSync, which is the way that you get your uh, documents so quickly, then you have a platform. When you put these three intersecting things together, you've got a platform. I have no idea if this is a good analogy, but it's, I'm actually not sure it's not as much. But um, it's like, the, you know, what we, we're in this deep transitional period that's going to go on for a long time, you know, not just decades, you know, probably more than a century, where all kinds of technologies are going to compete make platforms, to, to coalesce, we, we, we will coalesce technologies and make platforms out of them, and pretty much everything out there right now is so primitive that it's not that there, it's not that there aren't platforms, there are, but I think we need to sort of understand um, the complexity of actually changing from an analog print-based world to a digital dynamic world, and that the creation of durable Findable platforms is going to take a while. Great, thanks. Um, one more question from me, and I'm going to completely turn it over so I can go and take notes on all this. Um, and this uh, question, not everyone has to answer. It's just another starting question, and whoever feels free uh, to start, can start. Um, as cultural and intellectual discourse take to the internet, what are some important changes that you see impacting your field or? Uh, aspects of life relevant to your field. And you can just identify these um, for the purpose of elaborating on them in discussion. And also, I was told that uh, we're having trouble hearing some people um, in the back, I guess. So if you don't mind passing the mic around. As, as cultural and as cultural and intellectual discourse take to the internet, what are some important changes you see impacting your field or aspects of life relevant to your field? I'll be real quick. Uh, one of my favorite novels is uh, Don DeLillo's White Noise, and um, of course that appeared before we had the internet. Um, there's a lot of discussion in there of uh, misinformation and how uh, misinformation uh, can spread and become viral. And I think uh, um, things have only gotten worse uh, since then. And um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And one of our responsibilities as scholars is to sift through that and um, um, separate it out and add value to information that is worth retaining. I'll take it for a second. In, in a more uh, sort of focused, practical sense, I think uh, one of the things that we see because of the spread of, of uh, 
form of this, I think this is related to some of what, uh, what Laurie said, because of the spread of formerly isolated archival materials via uh, network technologies like the internet, um, it means that certain kinds of research become possible that were not possible before. In a very simple sense, you don't have to figure out how you're going to fund a trip to a, a library somewhere in order to do the research that you might have done formerly. Setting aside, of course, the absolutely essential issue about the paratextual traits of the original text you might be looking at and disciplines in which that would be of great relevance. If you're looking at medieval manuscripts, you need really good facsimile reproductions if you're going to trust your assessment of them. So that's, that's an obvious parenthesis there. But what this means is, and this is, I guess, related to the Google Books issue as well, for all the terrible errata and flaws and kind of eccentricities of, of Google Books, um, those sorts of tools make it possible for us to do certain kinds of comparative reading that would have been very difficult to do practically before. Um, and so uh, I think that has, it's always changed my uh, scholarly practice because I have access to texts, I often have access to full text searching of corpora that I would never have had access to before. Uh, so if, for example, you have the uh, uh, a corpus of an author, let's say, well, I, I, one of the areas in which I work is, is, is Jules Verne, the, the 19th century French author, and I have full text searchable versions of everything published by Verne, 64 novels, and so when you're looking for a particular repetition of a trope or his use of a particular term, you can perform instant full text searching. and and arrive at an understanding of the intertextual complexity of that author or any author like that in a way that it would have been very difficult to do before. You would have had to rely on memory and, and the notes that you take, and you couldn't be sure of, uh, say, a particular stylistic tick or quality of the author until you read all 64 books and noted stuff. So in a very practical sense, I think that's been one consequence for me in my work, and, and I when I teach um, these materials to students. I, I often talk to them about the opportunity they now have in these environments to read intertextually. And see, I would see that as um, slipping from technology to platform, going back to what Bob said. That we're shifting from a technology that facilitates a certain kind of reading to a, a mode of reading that is only possible through the technology, but it changes one's relationship to the underlying text space and one's relationship to the practice of reading. So that, does that make sense, Bob, that that's a shift from a technology to a platform? One thing I'm always concerned with is invisibility. Um, there's the thought that as all of these things are going online, well, enough is online or everything's going to be online. I often hear comments, um, won't everything, be, won't all the books be digitized in 10 years or 20 years or 100 years? The answer is no. Um, not from what we know of library collections, not from what we know, new, new collections are always being discovered. So many books are unique. Um, the Baldwin collection here, I use examples from UF, but if you read the library literature, it's pretty consistent that there are unique books in every library collection, historical society collection. It's just, for people that work in libraries, it's really normal, like, oh, this is the only copy known to exist. Or, you know, when we're sending records to the Library of Congress and they're, you know, title not known to exist, even though it's been covered under an earlier project for microfilming. Um, half of the Baldwin collection um, is expected to be unique. They aren't fully cataloged, so we're not sure, but we think probably half of them are unique. That's the Baldwin Library of Historical Children's Literature. Um, it's books in English, so definitely more, you know, books in English published in the U.S. and the U.K., so more common overall, um, more recent um, overall. And it's about 100,000 volumes. So when you're talking about half of them are probably unique, that's an enormous amount. Once you start talking about things, not just not published in English, um, not, thing, you know, not multiple copies of Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe, but once you start talking about things held only in smaller archives in different countries with different technologies available, there's a real risk of erasure or invisibility that occurs. Well, isn't it all online? Isn't enough online that we can see this as representative? Um, and that's a really strong no. <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons that we need to make sure that more things are represented online or that the online doesn't seem, you know, it's good enough. You know, what we can access online is good enough. And this ties in directly with our citation rules. Um, the fact that we don't require an MLA to say where you got the book is a real problem. Because if you're just citing, oh, well, I found it on Google Books, but I'll just act <coughs> like it's the print book, we should make a, a Everyone say where they got it. Is it online? What library did you get it from? Provenance should be included in our citation, and that's something that MLA does need to work on. Oh. Over here, I'll just say a quick thing and then um, carry it over there.
there, we won't take it back. <laughs> we want to get our money's worth out of ours. <laughs> yeah, just a quick thing I want to put in is I've, I've been exercised recently. Is this on? Working? No. Just yell. Is it working? There. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, an exercise recently on, I will talk about STEM disciplines. Uh, maybe some of us are familiar with this argument. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, and the governors before, they're cutting budgets and they want to only support STEM disciplines. And so, uh, and I have been kind of disappointed in how the humanities and the arts are replying to that. Um, some of our, our leading lights are saying, yes, we're useless and damn proud of it. And, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, I really think that we need to take seriously the, the entrepreneurial and economic impact of the uh, media that we uh, are in some ways responsible for. And, and so I'm promoting the idea of the hmm disciplines and specifically pronouncing that the mm, mm disciplines. <laughs> Beginning with the Campbell's soup, mm, mm, good. We are concerned with the good. I mean, this is, you know, way back. Uh, and <clears throat> those mm's are, are music, media, and movies. Uh, and then you put a little life in the beginning of the age for the humanities, and, and when you read about hmm as an interjection, you know that uh, it, it introduces a note of complexity. So the humanities introduce a note of complexity into the mm, mm good uh, part of the disciplines. And so I, I've been working on a um, video that I hope will go viral. I don't know if you can plan that actually, but I'm going to put a kitten in it maybe in the baby. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, slip, slip in this stuff. Um, but I was looking into the economic impact of <clears throat> entertainment, because according to the theory of electricity and apparatus, entertainment is a new institution that's the equivalent of religion and science in uh, previous apparatus. And uh, so I wanted, and, and by the way, this in, introduces a note of ambivalence about uh, recent uh, uh, legislation regarding uh, patents and so forth and, and uh, freedom of information versus uh, content providers making money on their content. And uh, I know a lot of my, my friends and colleagues are on the side of <coughs> free distribution. One thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, there have been many studies recently showing that uh, uh, the society is very happy to pay $500 for a device that delivers the content, but they want the content free. And the problem with that is that people that make the content, that's us, that is, that's our discipline. That's, we're the ones that write narratives and, and you know, re-educate the people, become actors and writers and so forth. Uh, so, you know, th this, is, this is somewhat of a problem. So I was looking into the, the amount of money that um, the economic impact of, of the, especially the mm -hmm disciplines, you know, it's enormous. Uh, what becomes a little troubling, though, when you start Googling and saying, well, which are the uh, entertainment industries, the leisure industries that make the most money? <clears throat> the top four are alcohol, prostitution, drugs, and pornography. Those are the top four earners. They beat out video games and movies and music by far. <laughs> you know, so so uh, I guess uh, the message here is to try to figure out how to you know, maybe teach those things. <laughs> Rhetoric of <laughs> <laughs> critique. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen the, um, the the mandate by the governor of Florida to you know basically justify your yourself, you know, account for yourself, and it's really troubling. You know, you kind of want to say, uh, yeah, I would prefer not to, right? <laughs> At least the way it's currently framed. Um, to go back to um, just a, a point that Laura was making about uh, Google Books and the problem about the invisibility of resources, one thing that's troubled me about the Google Books initiative is that, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of how it was done, but it's basically these um, factories of robots <laughs> chopping up books, scanning, and then turning into OCR, so you would have them online, right? And so just from the material reality of the production of Google Books, you're talking about the destruction of, of the, the printed artifact. Which is, you know, I'm not saying that's terrible, but it, it should, you know, maybe give us pause, something to think about. In terms of the original question, you know, the future of the field, there are a couple things that I'd like to to see happen. The first is in that came on board was the ped pedagogy. Can you hear me if I don't use the mic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Use it. Okay. 
Um, I am planning to uh, throw my hat into an NEH um, startup grant next year for uh, a clearinghouse for pedagogical practices in the wide field of the humanities and social sciences so that we can have a common site for the use of new media in our classrooms. If you are with me, <laughs> I encourage you to contact me and let me know because I need all the help I can get, but I think this needs to happen. It's absolutely frustrating to have such a dispersed set of tools that are out there, they're tantalizing, but you have to do an enormous amount of work to, to collect them. Right? So I think it would be a very useful, I don't know if it would count as a platform, but I think it would be something very exciting for all of us educators. So I'd love to see that. Um, secondly, um, I've been working with the Electronic Literature Directory to think about um, our future. And one of the biggest issues we have is um, a set of common metadata bibliographic standards. And so we're working with not just the ELO, but ELMSIP in Norway and other um, initiatives around the world to come up with such um, a standard um, so that when we talk about works of art, we um, again have a, a common vocabulary to do so. That's something I, I would love to see. Um, oh, and then and, and finally, that speaks to one of the the coolest things about the directory is we uh, had a tie-in with the Library of Congress, and so for certain key works of electronic literature, we will be able to archive them. Um, and again, that raised all sorts of interesting problems about metadata, bibliography, how are we talking about these things? Um, and so I would love to see a worldwide network with a common shared vocabulary uh, for uh, annotation. At this point, we can open it up to any questions anybody has for anybody. Bob, I have a question for you. I appreciate um, you giving us that de that definition of platform. I think, you know, um, Speak one of, up a little bit more. Yeah, I appreciate your that definition of platform. I think one of the most exciting and frustrating things about the digital communities is the use of discourse and the invention of discourse. Because there seems, you know, there seems to be so much circulating discourse that's inconsistently used. So I love this idea of the glossary because it will, I mean, not that language is ever stable, right? But I do think that that this, you know, the question and how it was answered about platform is the perfect example of how we need to sort out some of this discourse for clarity of our own ideas and invention of our own ideas. So I was, in, I was thinking about, you know, this ecosystem of the interrelated technologies and I was thinking about how, like, how those ecosystems are developed both by, you know, commercial entities, but then how users create their own ecosystems in different research methods. And I was wondering if you could just maybe expand or um, further develop your definition. Are you seeing a difference between uh, where that ecosystem is being developed? Do we need to make a distinction there? Um, I'm probably way, way out of my uh, pay rate here. Um, the technology that's sitting on this table, pretty much 100% of it came out of government, people-supported uh, efforts, not out of corporations. The, I mean, the internet and all the sort of digital technologies were all supported. All the early work was done uh, you know, at, the, at universities, supported mostly by the defense department, but you know, our tax dollars at work. Um, and then that those technologies, you know, make their way out of the university. You know, professors start companies. Um, or they just, you know, the universities start to license the technology to corporations. And that's where the development work takes place. I mean, uh, and I don't see that changing much with the one sort of caveat that in the U.S. in general, 
there seems to be a retreat from uh, deep research phase. So that it's, you know, even though the United States, you know, in, in the in post World War II, when the U.S. was sort of top dog and was sort of able to extract resources from the whole world, uh, there was the ability to spend lots of money on research, which we're enjoying today. Now that the U.S. Is, has sort of lost its position and it is increasingly, we see innovation coming from other parts of the world, not here. Uh, so I think that that's a pretty good thing. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just what's happening. Can I just take a follow-up on my question? So uh, I, I appreciate that answer. What I, what I want to try to get at is, say, OK, I'm, and this is Lou's question. I'm coming from a selfish place. Okay, So in my my current method where I'm doing this, like, you know, this track and stuff that I've talked to you about last night, I use, you know, like, Zotero, I use Google Images, I use similar images, I use all these different visual search engines. And so, I mean, according to this definition of platform, it's almost a, I mean, could it be said in your eyes that I'm inventing, I mean, I, because I'm putting these different technologies together in an ecosystem for a particular research method, am I, according to your definition, creating Probably not, platform? because, because what, okay, so Zotero, Right. on this machine, mm -hmm. to me, is really different than Zotero on, on this machine. Okay. Okay. So the plat, I mean, and to me, the, the, the interface for the human to Zotero is part of the platform. Okay. So in the, from that perspective, I would say, no, you're not. You, none of us can, I mean, we, we can conceive of platforms but no company, even Apple. You know, Apple comes the closest to make, you know, making the hardware and the software. If they like the internet better, they might actually. You know, you know. But you know, so I, it, it, it's it's pretty hard for certainly an individual to come up with a platform. Okay, it's a question of scale. Yeah, it's a question of scale. I, I think I really like that terminology, but I think there's a there's another term that this embraces both of those terms, and you, both of these people are are familiar with this term apparatus. This comes from media studies. The term apparatus is to say like literacy is an apparatus, morality is an apparatus, electricity is an apparatus. And what that means, and why it's useful to have that term, which was introduced in media studies to in film studies originally. Uh, some while back to get around the idea of, uh, of technological determinism, the sort of fluent idea that the medium is a message, or if you have TV, everybody's different. Uh, that what drives civilization is not its equipment, uh, but rather um, there's an apparatus, and, and, and the term apparatus includes not only technology and platform, but it also includes, if you remember, so if you just take the prototype of the invention of literacy in classical Greece, was the invention of school, and then the practices of schooling. So, 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 uh, an apparatus is a metaphysics. And what's really important for our discipline to remember is that uh, is that the, the metaphysics of electricity is not going to be invented by the STEM disciplines. It's simply not. And we have a role to invent the rhetoric and logic and practices of, of how people learn and think by means of these media. That's not going to be invented by IBM or, or Microsoft. Or or whatever. Um, and, and furthermore, um, another part of the apparatus is identity formation. So, uh, so, so, uh, so in the case of literacy, I mean, when you read about grammatology, you read that behaviors of selfhood, uh, political, democratic statehood, and so forth, these are inventions. Behaviors of citizenship are inventions uh, that separated uh, Greek civilization from the religious civilizations around them, that transformed the Greek people from tribal to to a city state. Those things are going on now. So the Arab Spring they talk about our social media. Uh, it's right to call the Arab Spring or whatever uh, a social media revolution, just like we should call the, the Protestant Reformation a print revolution. We all know that Luther would have either been burned at the stake or put into some kind of, given his own monastery system, uh, if there hadn't been a uh, print available to, to, to get the political system involved. 
Uh, so, so behaviors are invented as well. These are not invented by the STEM disciplines. And our disciplines have a responsibility to, to invent the apparatus. This is a role that, that we need to play and take a very active and forceful part in, uh, you know, in collaboration with platforms and the technologies as well. I, I'd like to add something to that too because I've been thinking about the title of this symposium for a little bit. I, I've um, <clears throat> had the experience of miswriting it several times in communications with my students. Um, I've, I've written, uh, so it's, the, it's digital platforms in the future of books, and I've written it as digital platforms in the future of the book, and I've written it as digital platforms in the futures of books, and, and that wavering between singularity and plurality has been sort of puzzling me for a bit. Um, we, we had a conversation yesterday about using the term reading uh, either as an honorific or as a kind of general umbrella term for a variety of uh, textual procedures that literate individuals engage in. And part of the problem was that we couldn't figure out well, what exactly was reading. If all these things are reading, then does not mean anything? The book doesn't have a future. It has futures, right? that are just as varied and just as conflictual and just as, I, I would make this assertion in other words, they're just as varied, just as conflictual, just as uncertain as the present and past uses of the literate apparatus, the, the apparatus of literacy. They depend very much upon the conditions of use. They depend very much upon <coughs> the intentions of the, or the agency of the user. They depend very much upon the technical um, uh, machinery of reading that's involved. Again, we can talk about the history of, you know, scribal culture, uh, print culture, and so on. All these things vary tremendously, and they vary tremendously not, all, not only over the course of history, but they they, they vary uh, tremendously synchronically within our own present moment, and within the reading experience of individuals who, at different settings and different circumstances, have different practices of reading. So when Greg is talking about apparatus and when Bob's talking about platform and technology, I think this is a, those are other versions of that claim I just made, which is that that reading. Um, I mean, it may well be that uh, e-books, print books, all these other varieties we think about are technologies, but that reading is platform, or that varieties of reading are a platform. That these are different kinds of relations to language. Some of those relations are intentional, and, and as I alluded to yesterday, I don't think very successfully. In, in, a, in a question to Lisa, many of those relations are unintentional, even unconscious. The way that literacy structures consciousness and structures subjectivity in the age of, of, of literacy, and as Greg has argued, I think very convincingly, in the age of what he calls electricy, new forms of subjectivity are emerging as a consequence. So when we when we puzzle over what are we inventing and what are we repeating and how do we innovate there? We're, we're traveling over this problem of apparatus and this problem of the present and the futures of reading. Um, it, it strikes me that it would be very useful to think about the fact that um, it's been messy for a very long time. Um, it's been messy since pretty much Ugg blew paint around his fingers on the side of a wall in a cave in the south of France 35 years ago. Um, I joke with my students that you know when you look at these paintings from Lascaux and you see a handprint on the wall, I said, that's it, it's already done. Michelangelo's a postscript to that. Right? Once you no, really, once you do that, once there is the intervention of agency and the making of a mark, everything's transformed. Um, but it gets immediately very, very messy. So without sort of engaging in ludicrous historical arcs, it's already been messy. It's already been conflictual. The distinction between technology and platform and the way that they merge and the way that they're half invented, incompletely invented, has already been going undergoing for a long time. And it, it behooves us, I think, as media historians to think very carefully about, about how the present moment is caught up in this kind of ramble, um, is engaged in all kinds of atavisms and inertias that we've inherited from uh, print culture um, and its varieties, and to see the prescriptions for what lies ahead in the future are going to be just as complex as the past has always been. Uh, and that, that might help us avoid the dystopian and utopian excesses that tend to haunt the discipline of the present moment. Um, to take, uh, I think it would be helpful to bring this into the conversation. Uh, 
Can you speak up? Yeah. I think it would be helpful to think of uh, in an eschatological sort of way. Like, where where could we think of, where is this going? Like, in 10 years, we walk into Apple and buy all your screens. And you buy one for your wall, one for your iPad, your iPhone. What, in, at what point do you <laughs> buy sunglasses that are screens and you're just listening? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I know. I, well, could, could you elaborate a little more? Because I, I think I missed your last comment there. At what point did, does the hardware that we're consuming all of our media on become part of us, physically? Is it, is I think it already is. Well, yes. It, I mean, the screen is a part of our nervous system. Right? Well, uh, you know, um, the, the notion of deterministic screen um, language functioning uh, as a filter or a screen mechanism that allows certain things through and uh, blocks others. Um, and the, the hardware is just an extension of that. I mean, that's one way to think about it. And on a very simple uh, example, like I mean, we already have phantom buses, you know, where people don't even have their cell phones right. in their pockets. I mean, they've already become, you know, physical extensions of our bodies. Why does that happen? That is really strange. Do other people have that? Yeah, I guess yeah. a lot of people yeah. do. Yeah. I'm buzzing. But that condition of prosthesis has been true for forever. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't think there's nothing anything unique about that. I mean, everyone in this room is prosthetically altered in ways that they that have become so commonplace to us that we don't think about it. Not just the obvious ways, like you know. Supplementary, supplementary instruments are seen better, like I'm wearing on my face right now, but we've all had vaccinations. We've all been prosthetically altered by our experience of language. I mean, those are two radical examples. Um, but I mean, the question about where it all ends, I mean, I've argued, again, this, this does get back, I suspect, in part, that's where your question comes from, because I, I, we've talked about it. Um, I've argued that um, the discourse of the media is shadowed by an eschatological discourse, by a discourse of crisis and that a lot of what goes on in the history of the media is best understood in relationship to crisis discourses. It's important, for example, a couple of my students from my hypermedia class are here, it's important to understand that Vannevar Bush's <coughs> Memex essay, which many of us claim is a kind of foundational text in the field for a number of reasons, maybe not all the ones that are claimed, it's important to understand that that thing is published in two versions between July 1945, or June 1945, and September 1945, and in between, something very important happens, which is the unleashing of the atomic genie. And so when you see Memex in relationship to uh, the, the contemporary discourse of you know, what, what's happening now, the, or what are the dangers of new technologies, it changes its qualities. Uh, Ted Nelson's uh, project <coughs> in all its form has been visited by, from the beginning, by terrors about the, uh, the, the dangers of forgetting dangers of, of, of loss and, and so on. So this, this, the question you're asking, I think, is a good question, but it's a very old question because it's a question that's visited every um, condition of media use from the very beginning. It doesn't mean that it can't be a productive question in the here and now if we attend to some of the things that have been brought up earlier, which is, and I think this is hinted in some ways by Bob's comment, which is that there, there does seem to be, speaking as an American, in this particular political and, and economic context, there does seem to be a sense that a change is taking place in the production of the technologies and the platforms that's shifting them from a public good towards a private good or a kind of capitalization or monetization of the new technologies. And, and all of what's going on, I mean, what happened last week with the, the SOPA protests and the shutting down of Wikipedia and so on, um, was really about a kind of discourse of crisis that's visited on the uses of these technologies and the battle back and forth between parties, each of whom thinks that the end is coming. You know, each of whom is like Chicken Little running around thinking that this will be the end of, of intellectual property or this will be the end of the public agora, you know. So, so um, there's no answer to the question that you're asking, but the fact that the question is always asked probably tells us something about the crisis relation of the agent to the media. Yeah. Doesn't that 